Great. Hello and welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to be here at Scottish Summit. Uh, Scotland is my absolute favorite country in the world. And uh, even though we can't be there in person, which I would have loved to be, uh, I'm very happy to be there in spirit and with you today at Scottish Summit. And today I will be taking you through a journey. And it may be a quite scary journey. We will be talking about security and how you can secure your Windows virtual desktop implementation from the endpoint or the, in, the outside and in, <laughs> even though it says inside and out. So, and also to have in mind, I will be talking about Windows virtual desktop here, but close to everything I say is applicable to any kind of EUC solution. And it may even be applicable to many of your other solutions that you're running inside of your IT infrastructure. And I will be sharing some quite horrific um, experiences I've had uh, working with cyber threats over the last year or so. But first, a big thank you to our sponsors, uh, ScriptRunner, DQ Global, Proximo, Redspire, Agilesis, and Hitachi Solutions. Uh, without them, this wouldn't have been possible. So thank you so much for making this event a reality. And of course, a big thank you to everyone who's volunteering and have worked so hard to get this show on the road. My name is Simon. Uh, I work as a principal technical architect at a cybersecurity company called TrueSec. I'm based in Sweden, but do work with customers all across the globe. TrueSec uh, works, as I said, within cybersecurity. We do secure development. We do um, the traditional security services like penetration testing and so on. I'm part of the infrastructure team, and we also do incident response. Uh, and that is what I will be basing a lot of what you will be hearing on today. So actual attacks that have happened and how you can prevent those in real life. I'm also a Microsoft Endpoint Manager MVP. Um, I used to travel around the world speaking at various conferences and user groups, something I really passionately enjoy. Uh, and I also teach quite a lot. I'm also part of Needy in Tech. So if you want to listen to a brilliant podcast, if I may say so myself, please tune in to that. But let's get started. And the goals for the day is to ensure that you're understanding the cyber threats of today and what's really going on. I'm not here to scare you, but it's important to realize that we are in a completely new world and where cyber threats is bigger than ever and possibly bigger than you ever could have imagined. We'll then move on and ensure that you also are able to prevent this. So preventing attacks from being successful, preventing uh, malicious actors to get access to your data, to your infrastructure. But the essential part and where I find that cybersecurity needs to improve on a cultural and fundamental level is ensuring that you do these preventive features while improving the user experience. You need to ensure that your users are happy. Otherwise, they will definitely find ways around whatever security measure you have implemented. And we'll start to talk about the weakest link. We'll start to get the foundation. What cyber threats are there uh, out there today? How do they look? How is that industry, which is, is today, building up? And uh, what's happening around the globe? We will also talk about cybersecurity as a strategy and how you need to think and how you need to act to ensure that you don't leave a single weak link in your infrastructure. We'll then apply all of that to Windows Virtual Desktop and how to secure that. And it's not just uh, to secure it against cyber threats, it's also to secure it against insider threats and to minimize the potential damage caused by an attacker if they get anywhere else. And we'll also talk about security context. So it depends on who you are and the security measures you need to take for a specific individual or a specific persona. And that you shouldn't be protecting everyone the same way because that will definitely cause a bad user experience. But let's start with the weakest link. And this is the honest truth that an attacker won't do anything more advanced than what they need to get access to your environment. They will do, an, in all honesty, an impressive job mapping out your entire infrastructure, finding that weakest link, 
and go for that. That may be a system, it may be a server, it may be an individual, but they will definitely find that weakest link. That's also how penetration testers usually work. Why try to do a very complicated hack when you can do a simple one? And to get some context on how this actually works, first, uh, we will likely see cybercrime bypassing drug trade globally in terms of revenue this year. So it will be one of the biggest criminal sectors this year. To put that in context, there is a group called Our Evil, uh, a hacker group. They are likely no more than 10 people very loosely connected to one another. But they uh, made an interview uh, just a couple of uh, weeks ago on YouTube where they said that they currently have a revenue of over 100 million US dollars on 10 people doing cyber attacks, ransomware, uh, extortion, and so on. But they, they even have a goal. They have a business plan. So they believe that they, as a group, will have a revenue of a total of 2 billion US dollars, on, and that's 10 people in just one or two years. We also know that we see more and more attacks now during the pandemic, of course, where a lot of organizations have implemented solutions which may have weak links. A third thing we know is that, and that's also based on the R Evil interview, but also what we see in the incidents we are involved in and with many of the big incidents going around currently in, in the world, that attackers will change their tactics. We have seen a lot of ransomware up until now, but at this point, they are now moving into data exfiltration and blackmailing, telling an organization that we have your data, we will release that to the public if you don't pay this ransom. And the ransoms are rapidly increasing. Like I said, I'm based in Sweden. Sweden is, for some reason, one of the countries in the world which is best from an attacker's point of view because we are most likely to pay the ransom and we pay the highest ransoms. The highest ransom a company which we have helped out have been asked to pay is 30 million US dollars after a hack, one single organization. And the interesting thing here is that it's always close to always based on the actual revenue of the company. So the attackers know that. They know if a company is going good and they will then just say, yeah, give us 10% of your earnings because we know you have the money. And that's one of the first takeaways. If you are uh, attacked by someone, if you have a ransomware attack and you get blackmailed, never ever pay. That's the worst thing you possibly could do, to never pay. And the last thing I want to, to talk about here is that we also see that everyone is a target. There is only one way of ensuring that you don't get hacked as a company or an organization, and that is to go bankrupt. If you earn money, you are a target. And that is due to the sort of stairs or the the, uh, the industry of cyber attacks. You have a group that tries to get access to credentials, to weak spots. They then sell them to an actual to the next group, which then do the actual attack. They get a foothold, they get a backdoor inside of an environment. They sell that in turn to next company that does the actual attack, encrypts uh, the uh, environment or exfiltrates data. So everyone, small or large, is definitely a target. And sorry, I also forgot to tell you, if you have any questions during this um, talk, please feel free to write them in the chat. And you will also be getting my contact details later on if there's anything you want to follow up on. So we have a very, very sophisticated industry out there, which always, always tries to find the weakest link. And I will now put that into context of WVD and also explain the weakest links we see and how easy it is for you to secure that. And I'm a big fan of history. I've always been a big fan of history. Like when I was really, really young, like six or seven years old, I started to read like history novels from, from Swedish history. And I've always been fascinated by castles, by knights, uh, by how they built security in the medieval ages. And we can learn quite a lot about the castle constructions and medieval protection, because that is in practice what we will be talking about when it comes to securing WVD. And as I, in many cases, see zero trust as well.
because it's easy to believe that a castle is only secured by its inner walls and that in practice for a IT infrastructure could of course be the network, uh, the firewalls, uh, the proxies, whatever we use as our outer defense or inner defense. But a causal is much more complex than that. And we'll be talking about the different aspects, the different gates an attacker needs to get through to get into the actual valuables that you may have inside of your causal or inside of your data center or inside of your cloud for the matter. It doesn't really matter. So with that, I will switch over to some demos uh, and taking you through a configuration from a security point of view of WVD. It won't be that much in terms of this is how you connect to WVD. We have all seen a virtual Windows desktop previously, but I will show you a couple of aspects of that and how you can secure it. So changing over to my demo machine. Let's see if it wants to play. We'll get back to why I run this in a virtual machine, by the way, uh, when we talk about context is key. But here you can see that I have an Azure portal and we will be moving around in various parts of this. But the first thing we want to do is to head into conditional access. Because I also have prepared a small session over here. So we'll drag that up here. And we will log in with our test user. Finn, and we enter a password. The password should, of course, be complex and unique. Uh, that is entire an entire session in itself. But if I'm able to enter the correct password, I will be prompted with an MFA. An MFA is one of the essential parts. And I'm, I'm sorry to have to say it again, because I know that most of you, if not all, know that MFA is an essential part of your IT security. But it's so easy today to implement. It works for close to every single scenario you may have. And it's the best and most foundational way of securing the access to any solution you may have. But how do we then set this up? Yeah, uh, I tend to do that with conditional access. And there are plenty of reasons to that. But one of them uh, is the context of the user. We don't want to, for to force MFA on all users at all points to all apps. We want to uh, force that when it's needed for a particular user. In this case, I've created a very, very basic policy, and I will explain why it says Linux here in just a second. Uh, but we have in included a few users, we have excluded a few users, and then we have cloud apps. And here, it's important to select the correct one. So if we go in here and take a look on the apps that we have available, search for Windows Virtual Desktop, you can see that I have three here. You may even see more in your environment depending on how it's set up and so on. The first one on top here, and I will briefly just increase that, hopefully. If I can find Zoom it. No. Uh, the top one is the one you're after for a new Windows Virtual Desktop infrastructure, the uh, Azure Resource Manager based one. The two below here, the green and the uh, reddish one are the old ones from the classic WVD implementation. So you can have different policies for each of them as well. But we have selected this one. We then head into the conditions. And this is where we can really target and create a good user experience with MFA2. Because here we can add everything like user risk and signing risk. That do, however, require you to have an Azure AD P2 license or equivalent. Um, then we head into device platforms. And when we talk about the connection, what do we do that connection from? And I see a very huge increase in the demand for thin clients or cheap or fairly cheap devices with high security that is easily to deploy, easily easy to ship out to everyone working from home and so on. 
in my personal opinion, uh, you shouldn't try to do thin clients based on Windows. It's a waste of a really, really capable operating system to do so. So I tend to leverage Linux thin clients uh, if I can, uh, because I see them as thin client. In a thin client perspective, they are likely more secure, easily, easily manage manageable, um, and actually easier to distribute in some cases as well. But for conditional access, if you want to use that with Linux, as you may see, it's not a supported platform. So how do we then protect that with conditional access? Well, you do a small trick where you include any device and exclude all devices. That will basically say everything that isn't supported, apply this rule. It's not 100%. It's more here to ensure a good user experience than actually securing anything. But that is a good tip to take away if you plan to run Linux thin clients. If you're on Windows, you're perfectly capable of applying specialized um, conditions and conditional access to only Windows or to any platform, really. A very common way of using this is also to have a location specified. So we can say that if you are inside of an office, uh, if you still are working at an office, many are also doing that for various reasons, you don't have to apply MFA. We may get back to that at a later stage, but use conditional access to secure and ensure that everyone that should have MFA have MFA and that they only get prompted when it's needed to secure that. So moving back to uh, Finn here and that uh, this will likely have um, clocked out now. So we'll see if we can get this back on track. And you can, of course, use any method for MFA. Uh, since I have a couple of devices and a couple of users, uh, I have been using text. But do try to move away from text messages. It's not that hard to, to spoof that especially, but also to actually even um, get access to your text messages. So try to the best possible you can to either go for the Azure Authenticator app or for hardware tokens like these from the various vendors that exists. That gives us access to the uh, Windows Virtual Desktop portal. So now we have spoken about the endpoint. We have spoken about the connection. Uh, and I can talk about conditional access for hours. So if you have any questions in regards to that, please feel free, feel free to reach out. Now we're in here. I have two uh, pools, uh, one default one and one validation host pool. And we'll notice a small difference between these. So if I try to connect to the default desktop, you can see that I only have microphone available here. If you have been connecting to Windows or to desktop previously, you may know that there usually are more checkboxes here than just this. If we go to the validation host pool instead, you can see that I have a clipboard, a microphone, and a printer. Why is that? Well, that is the next step. So once we have connected from our endpoint, we have done that strong authentication. We of course also need to secure the actual session to the session host. We can do that by heading into Windows Virtual Desktop, our host pools, and we have RDP properties. And this, if you have ever worked with uh, any kind of remote desktop solution, you know this. This is what you can configure within the actual RDP client on your Windows device. You can do that either in the user interface or you can do it in a, a actual text file where you add all of these different configurations. But in WVD, we can now do this per host pool. And we have a rather good graphical interface for this. So. If you can see here, don't redirect devices, don't redirect cameras, don't redirect drives. We can configure whatever is possible to get out from the host to the endpoint in a very, very granular way again. So we may have a situation where we have an app or a desktop, it's dependent on your needs, where we want to add extra protection. We don't want data exfiltrated from there. We can also to that add the, um, uh, 
ability to block screenshots of a uh, session uh, if we so desire. See where they've been hidden that. So that we actually can make that just black if someone tries to make a screenshot or even share that screen if it's highly sensitive information. So do think that through as well. What will the user accessing an app or a desktop be able to exfiltrate? That goes back to what I said first, that that is likely the way an attacker will work moving forward. They will get some kind of access to the credentials. If they then can sign in to your Windows virtual desktop environment, they have usually full access to that VM. And we'll talk about the inner workings of that in just a second. But do do a risk assessment of that. Okay, if an attacker gets access here, what are they able to extract from that VM? So do you use the RDP properties as again as needed? If you have a regular user accessing regular apps where you assume that there aren't any sensitive information, let them do what they need to do. Uh, you can also really create a good user experience here by saying, okay, if you try to access Teams. Uh, over WVD as a published app, you of course should uh, allow for camera and microphone redirection or it will become a very, very boring Teams call. But you may not need that for other purposes that will likely just consume uh, performance. So once we have got into the actual machine, we have a secure session, we have a secure connection, we have hopefully a secure endpoint, but now we're on a Windows operating system. And Windows is still Windows, even though it's running in Azure. You have a lot of security built into the Azure platform as such, but you still need to secure and protect your VMs. Some of you may have worked with other vendors previously, which have real, um, stateless or um, pooled um, device or virtual machines, provisioned machines, which when you shut them down, they disappear into there. For Windows Virtual Desktop, that is not how it works. Uh, you don't have any non-persistent desktops. Everything is persistent. You need to make them non-persistent or not. So assuming that someone get access to a VM inside of Azure, and this goes for all VMs inside of Azure, not just Windows Virtual Desktop, of course, you should monitor them in the same way as you do with your physical machines. No difference there. You shouldn't trust that uh, you can't get any malware inside of your Azure VMs because you're perfectly capable. It's just a VM uh, or a container for the matter. So another thing that if you are able to do implement an EDR, so endpoint detection and response platform. I personally tend to use uh, Defender for endpoints uh, since I'm a Microsoft person, uh, but there are other options as well. But do have something to monitor your devices. An antivirus today is just not enough. Then you may be a smaller organization uh, and it's a usually a rather costly implementation. Then take and then have a look, okay, how do we build our security posture? There are other ways of building a very, very secure environment. But if you are a couple of hundred or do very, very sensitive work, do consider an EDR, definitely. And now since a couple of months back, Defender for Endpoints or Endpoint is supported within WVD. That is both for dedicated devices. So one device one or one VM, one person, uh, but it's also for multi-session. So if you have up to, I think it's 50 that they now increase the user limit to, up to 50 concurrent users connecting to the same VM, that is the highest currently supported uh, number of users. This machine uh, do not have any alerts today, but if we take a brief look here, we can also, while we load the timeline, let's review here that it's actually part of my domain. We can talk about domain security for ages as well. It's a Windows 10 WVD uh, implementation. It's a bit old now, so I will need to take care of that later on. And once this timeline loads, we will be able to see exactly what is going on inside of this machine. And do consider this. You can't trust a machine that has been up and running. 
you need to ensure that they are secure. You can improve this by automation, of course. If you're able to always exchange your hosts, that is a very good way of building security yet again and to keeping them up to date also. Uh, but do monitor uh, even when they are running to ensure that if a user by mistake uh, browse to a malicious website and get a malware installed to their device, that shouldn't be able to uh, move further into your environment. And we'll talk about that in just a minute or so. So do secure your Windows Virtual Desktop VMs just as if, it, if they were physical machines. There are no difference in many of the solutions that you may be using on your physical machines is as applicable here. Talking about securing and context again. Now let's go to why I'm using a VM for my demo here, because this is just browser. I can do this from wherever, but I don't want to leave my admin credentials on my physical machine. It's way too easy to get access to any credential you have on a machine. And it doesn't matter if they are local, Azure AD, AD, doesn't really matter. You can get access to them with hacker tools available to anyone that knows how to Bing or Google uh, choose your browser or your search engine as you desire. So context again, I'm an admin, but I shouldn't have admin credentials laying around everywhere. And I, as an admin, should definitely not have all my admin privileges at all times. So do use some of the security features available in um, Azure, of course, to ensure that. But also use access control on your host pools. That is one of the absolute best things when WVD were moved onto the Azure Resource Manager model, that we now got a very, very powerful RBAC uh, model within uh, WVD as well. And within each individual host pool, we have a number of different um, roles. Many of these you recognize from Azure, owner, contributor, of, and so on. But we also have a number of unique ones to WVD. Always ensure that each individual administrator inside of WVD only have the appropriate permissions. They shouldn't have more and they shouldn't have all their permissions at once. But another thing that is actually quite interesting here, and we'll see if we can find that. Where is it? Blind. Even the the users that gets assigned a specific resource, a desktop, a application, that is also using uh, WVD uh, or the RBAC model. So you can automate this. You can automate access by using the RBAC model. You don't have to do that separately with a separate group. You can actually use your PIM as an example to only give access when requested or when needed by a user. That is also a very, very powerful tool and can really help you to increase that security posture. So do be aware that you have the opportunity to use RBAC both to limit the uh, administrators from doing any kind of harm if their accounts are breached, but also to ensure that the users get access to what they need when they need it. Okay. So now we have talked about the endpoint, we have talked about the connection, we have talked about the session, the session host, the access to the session host from an administrative point of view. What's next? Well, what I've been talking quite a lot about over the um, last couple of months or so, imagine the following. An attacker gets access to credentials. They can successfully sign into a WVD host pool. We ensure that they don't get uh, the ability to extract content over that session. And we may even be monitoring the device, hopefully. But if the other side of things is wide open, which is what I in unfortunately find in most of the environments where I come to do a health check or so, then they can easily go to another host and extract 
data from there. And that may not even be uh, visible to the uh, ones that are monitoring the EDR. So I, I'm now going to say something that will make you spit out your in brew or coffee or whatever you're drinking this morning, evening, wherever you are. There is a reason why I recommend all of my customers to not use VPN. VPN is unfortunately a very, very dangerous tool. And the reason for that isn't that the VPN protocol as such is insecure. It's how it's set up in the back end, where we try as administrators to create a good user experience, a seamless user experience. But that also means that we, in many cases, with a VPN gives uh, a managed or an unmanaged device full access to the entire infrastructure on the other end. That is why I tend to recommend these solutions independent on vendor rather than a VPN solution. But if you do the same mistake there, if you allow a, uh, a user to get access to a Windows virtual machine uh, within your infrastructure, within your cloud, and you don't prevent them from using certain either internet-based resources going out or internal resources going in, then you have opened up the same kind of gate. So there are a couple of options here. One thing you could do, moving back to our um, EDR, is that we can use Defender for Endpoint to do a web, web filtering uh, functionality within uh, the Windows machine. So we can either do web content filtering based on uh, different kinds of categories. So we want to block things like uh, high bandwidth in a VDI that is perfectly normal, I would say. Uh, we can do things like uh, hacking, criminal activity, weapons, whatever it can be. We can block that. We can also block individual URLs and services using indicators and even cloud app security. That is the outbound connection. A user shouldn't be able to use whatever they like inside of their VDI or virtual machine, if that is not what you want them to do, of course. In the other direction, when we start to configure the network interfaces going into your environment, we have a couple of options. The simplest and easiest one, and also the cheapest one, uh, would be to use network security groups. I think I have a rule set up somewhere here, where we uh, can set up rules. Okay, which protocols, which IP addresses, which ports are a certain network able to communicate to and to what. Uh, this is something I tend to do quite a lot. So I, to the inside, I may only allow access to domain controllers and the specific application servers that that VM needs and then limit the rest of the connectivity. Let's see if this loads. So in this case, I have a um, non-implemented SMB rule. So you could say that if I come from a certain IP address, a certain host, I'm not able to go to another host as an example. So you have a couple of options here. This is, this is the simplest way. You also have Azure Firewall and now also Azure Firewall Premium, which is uh, which if you are a bigger organization, because Azure Firewall comes at a rather hefty start price we are talking somewhere around 700 us dollars per month uh, for the minimum so if you are a smaller organization go for the network security groups if you're a larger organization and wants to have a more capable fire real firewall solution definitely go for azure firewall it's a brilliant tool to use and now especially with the premium SKU, you get even more functionality and that also give you uh, tags so you can say allow all Windows virtual desktop traffic, but nothing else. So you can even create a very, very uh, secure and completely close to at least isolated VM, which only uh, are able to, to communicate with exactly what you say. That is also why I see WVD being used as a privileged access workstation. I now have a local VM here, but I can definitely see Windows virtual desktop VMs being used as administrative machines with a very limited access to the resources they want to consume. Uh, because then you can be secure that you only have certain credentials on that. You can ensure that you minimize those credentials and minimize access using them. 
there are a ton of other things you can do. But these are the essentials, in my opinion. MFA, secure sessions, protecting and monitoring your VMs, controlling the network one way or another. And it's not necessarily so that you should and need to lock it down completely, but be very, very aware, especially what you're able to access on the inside. In the best of worlds, a VM should only have access to what it actually needs uh, inside of your environment. So do also consider that when you design your networking around WVD. Moving back to our slides, and we can do the equivalent here. Like we can talk about uh, the MFA. You need to say your name and you need to show that you have been invited to the castle to get in. You, you of course, as a next step, won't be able to bring whatever you like back outside. If you come in with something, you shouldn't be allowed to leave with something you shouldn't have. You, you, don't, you aren't allowed to steal and leave the castle. We then, of course, need to ensure that the interior of the castle is secure. We will have guards moving around with inside the castle and see, okay, we don't recognize you. Could you please state your name and what you're doing here? And also, it's not so that just because you got into the castle, you get into the uh, treasure hall or to the uh, queen with inside of the castle. And this also brings us back to context. And we will then um, finalize that in the summary in just a few minutes. But context is key. We are all different. We all have different needs. Do you have in mind that everyone, again, is a target? I, I hear, let, let's take my, my father as an example. He called me just before Christmas and said, Simon, I've, I've done it. I bought Bitcoins or I'm about to buy Bitcoins. Okay, why? Yes, someone said that a celebrity did that and they earn millions. And I, of course, said, <laughs> drop the phone and stop what you're doing. That may be something we all think of when in terms of everyone is under attack, everyone tries to get, or everyone tries to trick everyone, but also in an organization that is still the case. Any person is a potential first step to escalate to someone else. But that doesn't mean that everyone needs that highest level of protection. It's dependent on what access they have, the data they use, and so on. So it may not be so that you need to lock everyone down to the same extent. You may just uh, enforce MFA, and you can then have the same configurations for all the session hosts. But when it comes to what you're allowed to access, the um, additional security measures that you may add to the conditional access, what apps you're able to access and so on. That should be a context-driven discussion. Absolutely. We should have enough protection. We should have the right protection at the right time. And we also need to ensure that when we implement whatever we implement, it's a good user experience. But do also especially have in mind your administrators and your leadership team in, in most cases. You should always try to secure them just that little extra having them use a virtual machine to do their most sensitive work, possibly monitoring that session even closer to see that they are not in, in itself exfiltrating data. So always take that uh, as it is and use a context-based discussion when implementing any security feature. And that goes way beyond Windows Virtual Desktop, of course. As I started off with, the biggest security risk you have inside of your organization isn't users, it's unhappy users. If a user feel that they are seen, if they are able to do their job, they have no reason to do something that they shouldn't. So again, it's easy for us to blame that person or that person or that person because they are users, they are not technicians as we may be, but that is not the case. It's our job to ensure that perfect user experience to the extent we can while keeping it secure.
If you have any questions following up on this, I will summarize in just a minute or so. But if you have any questions that, that comes to mind after this session or during the, the rest of the day, I know that you have a lot of great content to look at. You will get my contact details later on. Uh, so please feel free to reach out with any questions um, that may arise after this session. But to summarize this, use the onion or the causal uh, approach. You should have layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of security. Depending on how close to the core you want to get, you need to pass more gates and more uh, layers in the onion to get to the core. And the core which our attackers are after today, as we speak, is your data inside of your organization. They will either encrypt it, but they will more likely try to steal it and then make you pay not to release it. We spoke about the castle. We spoke about the guards moving around inside of the castle. And that is what I see as zero trust. We can put these layers on, but never ever assume that anything is secure and continuously evaluate this. Even if someone already is inside of your environment, do not trust them. Make them show their ID once more. And that also go for physical security once we go back, come back to the office. We may have a lot of new colleagues that we haven't seen before that have been onboarded at home but do be very cautious. If you see something that is um, looks odd, ask. I know that the, the British government did a really good film on that. Uh, so always assume zero trust and do not trust your perimeter security. Collaboration is also key. We have touched on things like uh, Azure Active Directory and Office 365. We have talked about Windows Virtual Desktop which is usually one other team. We have talked about Windows Security, which again can be a team. A um, EDR is usually managed by, by a SOC team. We have the networking. And we of course have the all of the other colleagues we have with inside of an organization. We have customers, we have partners, we have whatever it can be. Security, and especially around WVD, is a collaboration and we can't be successful if we don't reach out hands and actually ask, okay, how can we do this? Can you improve that? We are now seeing that in the latest penetration test we did that this was our weakest link. How can we together move and help uh, sorting that out? But once we are in here, once we have shown our ID, passed the gate, done what we did, we may even have access to the crown jewels. We may be inside of the most beautiful castle, uh, and I personally find a data center rather beautiful, but I'm, I'm a bit odd that way. But do think of your infrastructure as a castle, which unfortunately today is under constant attack. People try to get in, and they have all the patience in the world. So always verify, never assume, even inside of your castle. With that, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any questions following up on this session, please feel free to reach out. I'm probably easiest to find on Twitter, but also uh, on my uh, email address. You can also replace TrueSec for BinderTech and you will be able to email there straight away too. I'm more than happy to answer any question you may have and help you improve your security posture and ensure that your WVD implementation is as secure as it should be. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your weekend, and ensure to catch many of the fantastic sessions during the Scottish Summit. Thank you so much.